Uh, good morning, church. Once, once again, welcome to our good morning, our, work, our worship service on this uh, second Sunday here in November of 2020, and now post-election, where those now that are at least be comfortable in knowing who our uh, president-elect is and the vice president, we want to say that even this morning as we stand here, we want to be in prayer for President-elect Biden and um, Mrs. Uh, Vice President Kamala Harris, we pray that the uh, Lord's will is going to be done. I know a lot of people just, just knowing that the wait is over of all the tension, the politics. Uh, I don't know about you, but I'm glad this day is here. It's behind us now. I know there's got many challenges coming before. But as we said on last week, this is the time that we ought to be praying for those who are given authority over us. And whether you like them or not, it is our job to support them and respect them because of who we are as the body of Christ. And for once again, we want to remind you that if we're still doing this COVID season, we want you to remember, remember to uh, social distancing, wear your fast mask, fast mask, face mask, and hand sanitizing so that uh, it's not about you, it's always about the other person. So we praise God for that. We want to continue to pray for our seniors. And uh, just our members at this time, we're looking forward to the time they open this back up and we'll be able to worship together again. But until then, we're just going to move forward doing what God has called us to do. We are in the holiday season. Thanksgiving is only uh, less than three weeks away from us. So for those there, I already see it. I was in the store the other day. They're already selling Christmas trees. So as we can see, society has not stopped. COVID didn't stop them from making money. It should not stop us from worshiping our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So without further ado, this morning we're going to open up with our scripture reading. Our scripture reading this morning is going to the Old Testament, uh, 1 Samuel, the 4th chapter, verses 1 through 11. And for those of you, uh, usually I'm preaching from the ESV this morning, because I like this text here and how it comes out and is read into the King James Version. So we can ask for those who have it, we're going to be reading from the King James, 1 Samuel, the 4th chapter, verses 1 through 11. And it reads, And the word came to all Israel. Now Israel went out against the Philistines to battle, and pitched beside Ebenezer. And the Philistines pitched at Esbad, and the Philistines put themselves in array against Israel. And when they joined battle, Israel was smitten before the Philistines, and they slew of the army of them of the army in of the army in the field for about four thousand men. And when the people were come into the camp, and all Israel, all the elders of Israel said, Wherefore hath the Lord smitten us today before the Philistines? Let us fetch the ark of the covenant of the Lord God out of Shiloh unto us that when it comes among us, it may save us out of the hands of the enemy. So the people sent to Shiloh that they might bring them from this the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord of hosts, which dwell between the cherubims, and the two sons of Eli, Hibnai, and Phinehas were there with the Ark of the Covenant of God. And when the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord came into the camp, all Israel shouted with a great shout, so that the earth rang again. And when the Philistines heard the noise of the shout, they said, What meaneth the noise of the great shout in the camp of the Hebrews? And they understood that the ark of the Lord was come into the camp. And when the Philistines were afraid, for they said, God comes into the camp. God is coming to the camp. And they said, Woe unto us, for there had not been such a thing there too. Where unto you, where unto us, woe, woe unto us, who shall deliver us out of the hand of these mighty gods? These are the gods that smote the Egyptians with all the plagues in the wilderness. Be strong and quit yourself like men, O ye Philistines, that ye be not servants unto the Hebrews as they had been to you. Quit yourselves like men and fight. And the Philistines fought, and Israel was smitten, and they fled every man into his tent, and there was a great slaughter, for there fell of Israel thirty thousand footmen. And the ark of God was taken, and the two sons of Hiphna, 
of Eli, Hukna, and Philehad was slain. May the Lord have a blessing to the hearing and reading of his holy word. At this time, let us bow in a word of prayer. Father God, we come this morning, Father, with our heads bowed, with our hearts are looking unto you because you are our God and we're your people. And you said that we can come boldly to the throne of grace, Father. And you said if we ask anything according to your will, this is the confidence that we have, that you hear us. And if you hear us, we know we have what we ask for. So Father, we ask you right now, God, for those who are watching us on Facebook, those who are watching us on YouTube, oh God, that you would open up their understanding to your word. And Lord, we pray, Father, for those, Lord, who even are with us this morning, Father, and those, oh God, who are just looking for a word for you. We pray, Father, for those uh, new president, elect, Father, and uh, Kamala Harris, Father, we pray, oh God, that your blessing be upon them. And our first responders, our firefighters, Lord, who are been dealing with the fires here in Southern California. Now, Lord, we ask you, oh God, that you would search my heart and search my mind. Lord, as I prepare to break your word this morning, Father, that I will not speak to myself, but I will speak the word of God. Now, let the words of my mouth, oh God, and meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. And all God's people said, Amen. 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 I want to talk to you this morning out of the subject here. There is no substitute for the real thing. You know what comes to my mind when I think about this, and I think about the commercial that used to be, they would have a, a commercial about Coca-Cola, and then it would show uh, there was a guy who would be in one of the foreign, um, uh, down in the Caribbean, and he would say there, he would come up with a Coke, and they'll have someone that looks like a Coke, but they would say, he would drink that Coke, and said, and once he do it, he'd be like, there's no substitute for the real thing. So in the same way in, in society, we have people in, in the, that are substituted for something that is real. And then we're going to find in our text, even this morning, that, that uh, here is the children of Israel. They were looking for, uh, instead of looking to God, they're looking for the things of God. And I believe there's no different in the day. There are people who were willing to take something other than what is real. You ever had a tape for something, you know, and I, I can think about, you know, I'm one that I love uh, ice cream and I would go to the store and I'd get ice cream and never forget my wife, she would go in there and she would go to the grocery store and buy ice cream and when I get in there and I put it, not looking at what's in there and I put it on my, and come find us that imitation ice cream. Oh man, you're talking about something that would definitely make me upset because I like the what? The real thing. And this, and this is what I want to talk to you about this morning. There is no substitute for the real thing and the real thing is God. They're not the things of God, the church of God, the people of God, but God himself. So in the text before us this morning, we have a story of the children of Israel who have been defeated by the Philistines' army. And you might be saying, well, why am I going to preach this morning on the subject of defeat? I know a lot of people may be saying that they have a negative connotation about defeat. But here, I decided to preach this sermon looking at defeat instead of victory. Why? And my reason is this because... I believe we should be able to learn from others' mistakes. We ought to be able to learn from other mistakes. I can never forget when I first came into the ministry, I used to go to a certain preacher and ask me, can you help me? And they would say, some things you just have to learn by experience. Some things you don't have to experience if you just learn from other people's mistakes. Amen. And we should be able to learn from others' mistakes because if you see if it happens to them, it's like a person on drugs. You think about it. When you go around and you see a person that uh, people say it never happened to me, you see a guy walking around and talking to the poles, and you say, well, that won't happen to me. Why not? And he made a mistake and got on the drugs, and now he's talking to the walls or talking to the pole. The same thing can happen to you. Stay away from Amen. drugs. Amen. And that's just what we're going to have here in this text. The mistake that cost 4,000 men to lose their lives. To lose their lives. And, that, and that's not enough to get your attention by itself. It got my attention when I heard it. 4,000 men because of somebody else's mistake? Well, I, I, it got mine, and I hope it'll get your uh, attention too. And I said, I, I, if a, and we all have said things in our lives where we say, well, I wish I would listen to my mother, I should have listened to my father, I should have listened to my boss, or I should have listened to so and so, and because you end up in a situation that caused you mental and physical pain, all because you what? Did not listen, listen. or you didn't learn from the mistakes that somebody else had made. 
So this story is one this morning that I had heard many times before. I've read it and read it over years and years, but never seen it in the light that God has revealed it to me here in this text. And that's why I come to the point where it said there is no substitute for the real thing. For the real thing. You ever got it, you know, I, I you know, I work uh, you know, in, in an industry where you know, you want things real, and you, you'll see something that somebody has knocked off something, or you go downtown L.A., and, and you, you see these lim- women walk around with these purses, and, and you look in there, it's a knockoff, it's not the real thing. There is no substitute but for no. the real thing. And that's why it comes to, there, and unless you have the true and living God, there is no substitute for that. Amen. what people say. Amen. So what we have here in the context here, the saying is, the Israelites have, been, have went out to fight with the Philistines, who had been their oppressor for over 20 years. So you figure it out here now. The Israelites have been under the oppression of the Philistines, and, and now they feel that they're strong enough to beat them. So they're saying, hey, we're going to go against them. We're tired, tired of them taking control of us. But there was a problem. And just like anything, there was sin in the camp. Eli, who was the judge of Israel at that time, had two sons who were just preachers for hire. Let me say that. What a preacher for hire is, they were only preaching to get what they can get out of their preaching, mm. is what we were telling. And this was usually because they lived an immoral life and they were serving themselves. In just one moment, I want to show you about the sin in the camp here. Eli, being the judge of the Israel, had two sons who were, they were preachers, but they just were not right. They were not living a righteous life for the Lord. They were doing things that God told them not to do. Here is a character in 1 Samuel 2 and 12. It says here, Now the sons of Eli were sons of Baal. They knew not God. And this is straight out what I tell you. First of all, they were preachers, but they didn't know God. Meaning they were not saved at all. And then it says in 2 Samuel 2 and 17, it said, Wherefore the sins of the young men were very great before the Lord. For the men abhorred the offering of the Lord. Guess what? Meaning that they were greedy for gain. When they said abhorred, that word abhorred means that they deterred and defied the things of God. And all they care about is what they can get for themselves. So like anybody you know, preachers oh, that you yes. know. Amen. But then he goes on another thing. Not only were we saying that they didn't know the Lord, not only were they greedy for gain, but in verse Samuel 2, 22, it says here, it says, now Eli was very old, the Eli being their father. And he had heard all that his sons did unto all Israel. Now here's the first part. Now, he the judge, he's the very first one that took care of his sons, right? He says, and, 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 and how they laid with the women that assembled at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. Then I hear, so, so in other words, these guys here, they, they, they were actually having this immoral sexual relationship with women that were part of a congregation there of Israel. Now these are preachers, right? Come on, somebody. Mm-hmm. And he said here, meaning that here, they abused their power for physical pleasure. That's what they did. Now, first of all, we found out they didn't know the Lord. Secondly, they were greedy for gain. Third, they were using their power to get their physical needs taken care of. And Eli, their father, which is the judge of Israel, knew about it and did nothing about it, continued to let them say. Can I pause for a moment and say this here? Anytime you have wicked leadership, the people are going to suffer. Amen. They were sitting in the camp and they need to deal with it. And, 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 and we think about the times that we live in it now. And anytime you want to follow someone, you want to follow somebody who is following the real and true and the living God. God. Amen. Amen. And this is what you can hear. All of that known by the uh, leaders of Israel, but they still felt they were ready to fight the oppressor. They knew these people weren't right, but they wanted to go fight their enemy. Remember, when you're sitting in a camp, you got to deal with it. Let me say it to you that are here that don't think that you can live in the flesh all week long and think God is going to bless you on Sunday morning. Mm-hmm. So many people that they live for themselves, living in sin all week long, then they come on Sunday morning, they want to shout, they want to holler, they want to give and think God's going to bless them. Well, this is exactly what right here. Now, don't think you're going to have the blessing of the Lord when you're not living right. Amen. Let's bring it to my text and look what he says here in uh, uh, 1 Samuel 4, verses 1 through 2. And then I'm going to read to you. 
And this is what God spoke to Samuel and said. And the word of Samuel came to all Israel. Now Israel went out against the Philistines to battle, and pitched beside Ebenezer, and the Philistines pitched in Ebenezer. Now you see, they battled against each other, they were set up. And say, and the Philistines put themselves in a raid against Israel, and when they had joined battle, which means when the fighting started, Israel was smitten before the, the Philistines. And they slew of the army of the field about 4,000 men. Here it is, because they were sitting in the camp, they're going to go fight their enemy, but they didn't deal with the sin. They didn't deal with their leaders who were living in sin. And the same thing today, brothers and sisters, if you, if you want God to bless you, you've got to deal with sin in the camp. Amen. Which brings me to the very first point I want to say to this text here, that they have somebody that feel you want the blessings of the Lord, but you're not doing what God tells you to do. And here, the very first thing is here. Never go to battle without confronting sin. Amen. Never go to battle without confronting sin. Let me say this point here. Not just a battle. Don't go, don't, don't get up in the morning, going to work, getting out there, figuring you're going to do serve the Lord, and you don't deal with the sin in your own life. So the Bible says that what? All have what? Sin. Sin and come short of the glory, glory of God. Amen? But here, if you have sinned in your life, here's what we said, those that are saved, you know Jesus Christ, the Lord and Savior. He said, if you sin, you have an advocate with your father. An advocate is a lawyer. Somebody is pleading your case, and Christ knew that you and I are not perfect. But he said, he said, if you confess your sins, he'll be what? Faithful and, and just to forgive you and to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. So what I'm trying to say, don't start your day off, don't start your job off, don't go to battle against Satan if you have not confronted the sin in your own life. Here is the children of Israel were getting ready to go to battle, but they had sin in the camp. Mm. Amen? And the consequences of sin in Eli's son had called these men to lose their lives. Yeah. Amen. Amen. So it is with you and I, if we should start out each of our week, each day, each hour of our lives with unconfessed sin, because there is no battle to be fought every day. Amen? Amen. And if you don't confess and repent of your sin, there will be no victory to rejoice in. Amen? Amen. Sin in your life gives Satan an open door to destroy your testimony. Yes. Amen. All he needs is a crack to get in. Let me tell somebody this morning about this truth. Scripture says Satan is like a what? A roaring lion seeking whom he, he may destroy. Mm -hmm. Amen? Mm -hmm. Let me say this. He's like a roaring lion. Here's the point I want to help you with this. You see, he's not a lion. Scripture says he's like. That means that he, he did, uh, um, he's really just making noise. Mm. Amen? That's all he's doing. He's making a lot of noise. He's not a lion. Satan is just making noise. If people hear noise, they get afraid, right? He can't destroy you because you belong to, to God. God. Amen. So you need to deal with the sin in your life. Amen. Amen. How do we know that First John tells in 4 and 4, he says here, why Satan can't do nothing to us? Are we the gods here? He said, you are of God, little children, and have overcome them. Because what? Greater is he that's in you than he that's, that's in, in the world. world. So in other words, don't let Satan get the victory of your life and you just live in sin. Amen. Confess and repent of it. Amen. Come on, somebody. Amen. Satan's a royal lion. He's making noise. And a lot of people, the reason why even this time that we live in this political thing here and this, and this pandemic, there are people who are very fearful. And have, you know why? Because you need to deal with the sin of unbelief. Amen. When you're, when you're worried, you're not trusting God. God. Amen. See, we worry about a person who drinks, a person who smokes, a person not committing adultery. But the number one sin that the average person do is that they just don't trust God. Amen. Amen. Come on, somebody. Amen. It's either you believe it or you don't. Don't. So that's not a sin. I mean, that's a sin. Come on. If you're not trusting God, that's what it is. Amen. And that's what here. Back to the text is here. Now we see the sin in the camp of Israel represents the sin of the nation of Israel. Because they didn't deal with it, that means the whole nation was going to suffer. The camp for you and I represents, you know, I mean, the, the camp for you and I represents the church, our home, our personal life. God even gave Eli a chance to deal with the problem. But Eli was soft. Amen. So he promised to take care of the problem. He told God, I'll take 
take care of it, but he never did. It's just like David. Remember, David committed a sin with Bathsheba. Right? You know what he did? He saw, he went out there, saw Bathsheba. He wanted her. He liked her. He had him go get her. He had uh, a physical relations with her. And because she got pregnant, he had her husband killed. Mm -hmm. Right? And then now he had sin in his life. Now, with his son, after his son, uh, I forget his name now, one of his sons raped his sister, Tamar. Mm -hmm. And his other brother, Absalom, knew about it and told his dad, aren't you going to do something with him for raping her? Mm -hmm. But David had guilt in his own life, so he didn't want to deal with the sin, and it called his family to be in disarray. In the same way, brothers and sisters, if you're going to sit in the camp, you need to deal with it. Whether it's in my life, whether it's in the deacon's life, in the usher's life, we need to deal with sin if we're going to glorify God. Come, somebody. Yes. And he comes in 2 and 34, he said, and this shall be a sign unto thee, now, this is God here. Because he hasn't dealt with me, so God is serious about sin. Mm -hmm. He said, and this is a sign unto thee, that thou shalt come unto, upon thy sons unto hook thy infinity in one day, and they shall die, both of them. God said, because you didn't deal with it, I'm going to allow your sons to be killed. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's serious to me. Come on, somebody. Yeah. So, and one of the things I want to say here, and what they did, the second point is, first of all, don't go to, uh, to battle with sin in the camp. Secondly, don't blame God for your failures. Mm -hmm. And then we're going to see that's exactly what you're going to do. That's the very first thing we do. When something happens, like, well, maybe it wasn't the will of the Lord. Or, you know, the devil will show up. You know what you did? Look at the text in here, verse 3. It said, when the people were coming to the camp, the elders of Israel said, wherefore, has the Lord smitten us today before the Philistines? That's what they said. Instead of saying, this, what have we done? They blame it on the Lord. Don't it sound like somebody you know? The leader called a meeting not to fast, not to pray, or to seek the Lord for his guidance of the situation, but called a meeting to express their displeasure with God. Look what God has done for us. He's spitting us today. It wasn't God's problem. He told Eli to deal with the situation, and he didn't, and 4,000 men died. Man, how true this is with us today. The moment something doesn't happen the way we want it, we blame God. Well, it wasn't his will. Or we'll say it, it was not the Lord's will, or God is testing my faith, instead of examining yourself to see if there's sin, you have sinned against God. That's what we do. We'll say, instead of, and until we read it just last Sunday on communion, let a man what? Examine, examine himself. himself. Instead of looking at what somebody else has done, look at your own life. Are you living right for God? The one of the things I say here as a preacher and myself, and people say, well, why? I tell my nerves before I go to the pool. You know what? I don't take credit, but it's myself. Amen. They said, you've been preaching a long time. You get nervous? Yes, I get nervous. Why? Because I don't get so confident in Terry Jean Whitehurst. Amen. I need the Lord. Trust God. Come on, somebody. Amen. But so what happens here, and if something happened, I want to blame it on him, not me. Amen. Say, Lord, I stood up. You were supposed to speak, not me. Yes. So the right thing for them would have been to confess their sins, repent of their sins, and then God, instead of being sufficient in himself, and so often that's what we do. Instead of dealing with our own sin, we start blaming God. It's not the Lord's will. But in Proverbs 19 and, and 3, it says here, the foolishness of man perverted his way, and his heart fret against the Lord. In other words, the foolishness of men, instead of you dealing with it, you blame it on God. Mm. In other words, Solomon has said, how crazy it is to think you have a right to get angry with God because you didn't get your own way. Come on, somebody. Have you been there? Lord, I've been praying for this. Lord, I want you to heal, heal this. I never forget the uh, illustration that Dr. J. Burnham gave, gave me when he was pastor here in Los Angeles at the church at Open Door. He says that he was preaching how God will answer your prayer and do these different things here. And there was a lady that was coming in the Bible study. She was sitting there. She couldn't wait to she finish and get to talk to him. She came to him and she was hot. She came to him and said, how dare you, Dr. McKee, and say that if you ask God and, and he, will, he will do what you ask him for. And Dr. McKee said to her, he said, he will do that. But he said, he said, that is a conditional promise. And what did he mean, he said? He said, if you love me, keep my commandment, and you can ask whatever you will, and I will do it. 
And so he asked the lady, have you been keeping his commandments? Mm. She went away broken hearted. See, we want God to bless us when we're not right. Mm -hmm. Amen. Amen. Come on, somebody. Amen. And this is what he said here. So these Ian Israel leaders were blind to their own sin and superficiality. They respond by showing how far they were really from the Lord. Yeah, they were leading God's people. They didn't deal with Eli's two sons who were living in sin. And here, and they wanted to go to battle. Now they did. And then he goes to the three B. And look what he says here. This, now this is the part that really gets me. This is now. They knew there was a problem, right? Instead of them seeking the Lord, here's where it is. There's no substitute for the real thing. Look what it says here in 4, 3, B. It said, this is what they did. Let us fetch the ark of the covenant of the Lord God out of what? Shadow unto us. That when it has come among us, we may serve, it may save us out of the hand of the enemy. And who are they looking to save them? Look at it. It is a God. Us. Let us seek what? The ark um, of the Lord out of Shiloh. Not seek God, but seek the things of God. Uh, right, if I can just get to church on Sunday morning, mm -hmm. if I can just get the prayer meeting, if I can just go to church, if I can get somebody to just pray for me, when you should be just seeking the Lord for help. Amen. Or if I just pay my tithes, or if I do this, God is going to bless me. No, you need to be seeking the Lord. Amen. But they should have called on the Lord instead of the things of God. Yes. And this is a big problem, I believe, with the body of Christ today. And we had the bigger church. We had the better choir. We had more money in our pew. And we had better preachers. And we had this. That would be, that's not the answer. You need to be seeking God. Amen. You remember the church of Ephesus? Over the book of Revelation? It was a church. It was a church built on. You would say that. They didn't tolerate evil. They, they were held to the doctrines of God. But yet he says to them, I have one thing against you. And what was that? They have left their first, first love. love. In other words, they were busy with the things of God, but they forgot the God of the things. And that's what we are today. Come on, somebody. Amen. That's why I said there's no substitute for the what? The for real, real thing. thing. Speak to me. Was bringing to my final point the central thought of this whole message. I did all of that to bring it to this point to show you how these people, 4,000 people, mm -hmm. lost their lives because they didn't deal with sin yes. again. Secondly, instead of seeking the Lord, they start blaming God for their own problem, not dealing with sin. And now they come, instead of going to God, they say, we need to go get the Ark of the Covenant because it's going to save us. The, the church won't save you, Bert, church people. Paying your tithes ain't going to serve you. Being baptized is not going to save you. Amen. You have to have a personal relationship with, with Jesus, Jesus Christ. Christ. You Amen. have to come to him and say, Lord, I am a sinner in the need of the Savior. Savior. Amen. I believe you died on the cross for my sins, and I believe you rose from the grave. And I'm asking you to come into my heart and be my Lord and Savior. I'm not asking you, I don't want to be a member of the church. Mm. I don't want to shake the preacher's hand. Amen. I want a personal Amen. relationship with you. Amen. The Jesus Christ can't save you, Amen. Church. God's coming back for a church where I spot, spot a wrinkle. wrinkle. And it's only through those that have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Amen. Somebody didn't say amen. If I gotta amen. say myself. Third point. There is no substitute for the real thing. Now, for those who are ice cream lovers, and if you really had good ice cream before, and you got your cookies out and you ready to eat your ice cream, got your bowl sitting there, you got your favorite movie on, you just ate your dinner, and now you want a good dessert. And you sit down there, and somebody bring you ice milk. Mm. <laughs> mm, mm, mm. You're not going to say something that God may not be pleased with them because they brought you ice milk instead of ice cream. Why? Because there's no substitute for the real thing. And if you are a Coke drinker, you remember that. Don't let somebody bring you a Pepsi. <laughs> You want a Coke? <laughs> Amen. Now, now I'm going to go somewhere y'all don't think I can go. If, if, if you used to a slits and they bring you a, a malt liquor, you ain't going to have it. You want the what? <laughs> the real thing. I hope not. <laughs> Come on, somebody. Amen. Amen. So here, if you want something to do for the real things in your physical life, why about your spiritual life? Amen. But here, this is the reason why they did that. Knowing the history of the ark, that it was carried, okay, that they carried the ark of the covenant. Remember when it was going across the River Jordan? It was there. When they had the ark of the covenant, the water 
was open and they would cross on dry ground because they had the what? The Ark of the Covenant. Amen. And when they got into the promised land, they got there, they had the Ark of the Covenant. So the leaders were superstitious. They thought, wait, as long as I have this, you ever see people that they don't, they, they ride in their car, they put a Bible on the dashboard? Or oh, you see people that believe they have a rosary hanging down from their, their uh, rear view mirror thinking that's going to protect them? That's superstitious. <coughs> Instead of trusting the true and living God, you're trusting the things of, of God. God. Amen. Amen. Now, let me say, now there are some things that in the, in the Ark of the Covenant that had some spiritual significance. But it all represents the things of the God. What was in the Ark of the Covenant? Very, it was a very sacred box. And it had a piece of manna in it. And the piece of manna it was a reminder of them how God made provision for them when they were in the wilderness. Secondly, it had Aaron's rod. That means it's showing the Aaron's rod is what they led them when they were going to get to battle. It represented the protection of God. Then it had the, uh, the, the, Ark of, the Ark of the Covenant. It had the cherubims that represents the presence of God. So here, all these things are the things of God, but not God. The manner shows that God will provide. The Ark of the Covenant, you mean the, the uh, um, the Aaron's rod means God will protect you. The cherubim means God's presence is with you. But guess what? It's still not God. God. Amen. Come on, somebody. It's not Amen. the real thing. Don't, don't bring me a, a cross. Don't bring me a, a Bible. Bring me God. God. Amen. Amen, church. Amen. So in essence, that what the leader would call was the things of God represent. The thing, they represented God, but not God himself. When they should have been, when you're going through something, don't bring me something that represents me. Bring me God. They were substituting the things of God for God himself. And church, let me tell you, this has been the message for all of us. If you're looking for it during this pandemic, you, and you know, God, we just, we just need a cure. Or Lord, we just need the right person. And, and now we've got the presidents and the president-elect. We just need you to do this for them. Don't, those are not God. Amen. Amen. The psalms, in essence, because their, their faith was based on the religious rituals and then external references, uh, observances. This is a big mistake that people make today. They trust in the church building that's keeping them from living in sin. There's some people think they want some things they want to do because they're in the church. But when you do it in the church or outside the church, sin Still is sin. The same no matter where you do it. Amen. They see the church building as a sacred instead of their own body. Mm. There are some people who feel that they're safely, they're, they're safe because they take communion. If you take communion with sin or you don't take communion with sin in life, sin is still sin. Mm. There are people that feel that they're saved because they have a position in the church. I'm the pastor. I'm a usher. I'm a deacon. I'm, I'm a mother of the church. I don't care. Position is not going to save, save you. Amen. When in reality, none of these things can save you, just like the Ark of the Covenant could not save the children of Israel. These leaders had their own problems because their superstitions show that they were void of spiritual life. They really didn't have the right relationship with God. And let me tell you, brothers and sisters, and this thing here, they cannot let me know. Here's a verse that you need to put to memory. Matthew 5 and 20 said, Except your righteousness exceed that of a what? Of the scribes and the Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Why? Because they thought that they just kept the things external, they were right with God. There are people who say, I don't drink, I don't smoke, I don't chase women, I don't do these things here, and they think they're going to heaven. There are people who are going to tell you, who drink, who do those things here, who will go because they have a relationship with God. I'm not justified in any way. Amen. What I'm trying to say, you're not saved by your external. God is looking on your heart. Come on, somebody. Amen. Don't substitute anything for the real thing. Mm -hmm. Look what Paul told Timothy in 2 Timothy 3 and 5. He said, they have a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. He said, from such turn away. People who are saying, look at me, look what I've done. Who are they, they always put other folks down when they're going to the flesh, but they're just as bad. When you trust in the things of God over having a personal relationship with God, you're in bad shape. You are being deceived. And Jesus says here, it is a spirit that quicken, the flesh profits nothing. The words I speak to you, he said, they are life. But some of them believe not. Amen. That was in John 6 and 63 and 64. And he said, 
It is the spirit that quickened. Amen. In other words, it, it wasn't the things of God. The flesh profits you what? Nothing. But the words I speak to you are life. What is that? you got to have a relationship with Jesus Christ. But some of you believe not. You would think they have learned their lesson. But no. They sent the same two preachers to go get the box. You see your law. We're going to send the people who are in sin to go get the box. We need to be careful in this coming, the coming year and as we're going through it here to make sure that we're not worshiping the external things of God. Instead of, oh, you worship God, okay, but now because we got the right people who we wanted in, in the office, or because the other person that you didn't want in the office, the person you want is not in the office, you're upset, and you're thinking about them when you're already living and trusting the true and living God. Amen. We should always ask ourselves, are we worshiping man, or are we worshiping God. a method? Are we worshiping the worship place? There's some people that can't wait. When they get, the reason why, and I said the same, this is, I believe God has ordained this time. Why? Because there are some people, they thought they were saved because they went in church mm -hmm. or because they go to church. But you know what? I learned a lesson. I'll never forget Elder uh, Willie Richards. When I was a young man just coming out of the world and I, I had an addictive personality, I used to love to get high, love to drink and do all those things. And then when I had to gave my life to the Lord, I was addicted to church. I was there Sunday, I was there Monday, I was there on Wednesday nights, I was there for Bible study, I was there for prayer meetings, I was for choirs, you name it, I was there. And I thought that was my salvation. And I'll never forget the one day Elder Richards told me, he said, Terry, I want you to stay home next Sunday. Man, I thought, man, he went, what's wrong with him? You telling me to stay home from church? I got upset with him. But I did it. I stayed home and then I, I saw him when I got to work the other day. He said, Terry, are you still saved? He said, yeah. He said, well, your salvation is not in that building. Amen. Your salvation is with Jesus Christ. Amen. But see, I thought I had to be there to be saved. Yes. Come on, somebody. Amen. This was in my heart. Yes, I go to church, but if I don't go to church, I'm just as saved as I've never got into a church building. Amen. Come on, somebody. Amen. Mm. God will use the very same simple people to achieve his own selfish goal. God allowed that. Next week, I'm going to be going later on in this chapter, and I'm going to tell you what happened after this here. But in 1 Samuel 2 and 30, it said, Them that honor me, I will what? Honor. God says, if you honor me, not the things of God, you honor him, how you do that? By worshiping him as a true and living God, that you know his son, Jesus Christ, died on the cross for your sins and rose from the grave, and I don't care how many sins you have done. The only sin that God will not forgive you for is blaspheming him. The Holy Spirit means you don't believe who he is. You deny him. I don't care. And here's the thing about it. I think that David is with God forgives murder. Mm -hmm. Amen. Amen. Well, you know. He doesn't like it, but he will forgive. There is. He said, you confess your sins. He's what? Faithful. Faithful. And just to forgive you. Mm -hmm. So here's our close. And here's the points I want you to remember. There's no such thing as a real thing. First of all, never go to battle without confronting sin. That means, and I'm not talking about a spiritual battle, but every day in your life, don't start your day off without first spending time with the Lord, confessing your sin. And then when you're going through your day, sometimes before I even get on the freeway, I get up, and it's only about a mile and a half from my house to the freeway, but somebody has got on my nerves. And guess what? I got to ask God to forgive me before I get on the freeway. So guess what? I've been asking him to forgive me already, and I ain't even got to work. Mm. Are, are y'all with me? Amen. Then when I make a mistake and I end up in a bad situation, it says first, never blame God for your failure, never. for what you have done. Amen. Just confess it, repent of it, and move on. Don't say, you know, the Lord was just trying to test my faith. God didn't tempt me. He said, tells him in James, none of us are tempted. We're drawn and enticed by our own lust. lust. Amen. Lastly, and this is the context. Never substitute for the real thing. What is the real thing? Knowing the true and living God. Amen. The same God that said, let there be light, is the same God that sent his only begotten Son that says that whosoever, whosoever, whether you're red, black, whether you're Democrat, Republican, whether you're Chinese or whether you're Russian, whether you're black or whether you're white, whomsoever will. Yeah. Confess, believe on me. That word believe is trust in his son's death, burial, and resurrection. resurrection. There's no substitute for it. And when you have that, 
You're guaranteed. You got the real relationship you have with Jesus Christ. Amen. And if you're here today, if you're not made it, if Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior, this time you can do it. You say, I don't think I've been trying to get myself right. You don't have to get yourself right. Amen. You need to come to get here and make you right. Amen. But if you're convicted this morning and realize you've been substituting the things of God, thoughts of God, and it's so often, and you know, and I don't want to deliver this point either because I want to close this message. But so often I've done so many funerals and I always see on that obituary it says that that person, they accepted Christ as an early age and they never came back. And they ain't been to church sin. Well, I'm telling you, I ain't not put in heaven. Mm -mm. Because if you belong to Christ, somewhere along the line, you're going to get back. convicted, you're going to repent, you yeah. may re dedicate your life at a later date, but you're yeah. coming back before you go in there. Amen. Amen. Don't substitute for the real grave. Baptism, mama praying for you, somebody prophesied over you, there's no substitute for what God said he'd do through his son, Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. And you can do that today. So as we close the word of prayer, I'm going to ask you, if you haven't known Jesus Christ, you just pray with me. Say, Lord, I know I'm a sinner. And I can't save myself. I can't stop sinning. Mm -hmm. But I believe that you are the son of God. And I believe that you died on the cross for my sin. And I believe you rose from the grave. And I'm asking you to come into my heart right now, Lord. Yes, Lord. Be my Lord, be my ruler, and be my Savior. You said, if I confess with my mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart, I raise you to raise your dead, I shall be saved. You can be saved right now if you believe that. Yes, Lord. The opportunity is yours. God bless you. God keep you. It's my prayer. Amen. 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 We thank God for it. For those as we hope this message was a blessing to you, we will continue this next week. We'll be. Just drop it down to the next few verses in the same chapter here to show you what happens when you, uh, what God does. When, when all of a sudden now you don't deal with sin and now the consequences in your life not only will it affect you, your family will affect those around you. So for those that are giving, it's time to give. Remember, Bible, the Bible says God loves a what? A cheerful giver. It's better give than then to receive. And there are two ways you can give here at Good News. You can either mail your gifts in to Good News Church P.O. Box. 92954, Pasadena, California, 91109-2954. Or you can use the cash at Venmo and you put Good News Church Pasadena. Amen. God bless you. I keep you and remind you that we're still having our Bible studies on Wednesday night. And now I need to change the time on it now. It's from 7.30 to 8 o'clock. We're only going 30 minutes now. Uh, so I'm going to ask that you be blessed to assess that at 8.30, but it's from 7.30 to 8 o'clock. And we're we'll in the eighth chapter of Proverbs. We work in each week through it. We've been eight weeks that we've been in there. I have been blessed by it, and I pray that you are too. But we're going to remember it here to share us on Microsoft and uh, subscribe to us on YouTube. Remember here at Good News, everybody is somebody in the eyes of the Lord. God bless you, God keep you, is our prayer. So our right hands are you be together. Now the heaven is able to keep you from falling and present you falling towards present with seated joy. To the only wise God, our Savior, be glory, majesty, dominion, and power, both now and forever. May we all say together, Amen. Amen. God bless you, God. Keep you my prayer. Have a blessed week in the Lord. Amen.